Hi guys, I'm Raina, that's Neha over there, and we're basically going to be hosting this virtual webinar for computer programming with C++ with Tech Girls. And so I know it's like a crazy time out there with the pandemic going on right now, but you know, we still want to be providing you with like free material for you to like learn different kinds of coding. And so the perk with this webinar is that you can pause it at any time, you can like skip around if you need to like go look at something again, or if you already know certain um, topics and you want to learn other topics that we discuss later in the webinar, like it's totally up to you. You can see this at any time on Tech Girls' uh, YouTube. And so let's just get started. All right. Okay. So I'm Miha, like Rena mentioned. Um, I'm a junior in high school and I'm familiar with Java and Python and obviously C++ because that's what this workshop is about or webinars. Um, I've taken AP Computer Science and Computer Science 3 Honors, and I've been a pianist for nine years. Okay, so I'm Raina. Um, I'm also a junior in high school, and I know some stuff about Java and HTML. And so, like Niho, I've taken AP Computer Science and CompSci 3 Honors, and we actually took CompSci 3 Honors together. Um, yeah. Beyond all this, I'm a debater and a politics enthusiast. And uh, we know that computer science isn't necessarily the thing for girls but but when we both took computer science three we realized like how interesting it is and we also wanted to give that for you guys and start getting us interested in different languages and see which one works for you guys okay so let's talk about what makes c plus plus special so um the thing about c plus plus is it's a highly portable system level embedded high performance um, language, and I know that sounds a little crazy, but what makes C++ really special is that everyone can like type in it in English, and um, it's able to make a lot of applications, and a lot of um, companies use it today as well, and it's useful for competitions, like USACO is like a famous one with US computing, USA Computing Olympiad, and um, using C++ makes it super simple because it is like short lines of code and it's really fast and gets the job done. And another thing is object-oriented programming or OOPS is the acronym for it. And that just means that it's a structured way to use it and you've got classes and methods, which isn't something we'll be um, covering during this webinar, but it's something that you'll learn later on and it keeps your coding organized and um, easy to like read and stuff. Um, let's talk about what we're going to do today. Yeah, so today in this webinar, we're basically going to be going through like some basic programming concepts that include like data types, like what an int, a string is, etc. Um, some logic statements, so in that case like an if statement, so like if I enter like x into the computer, I want it to return 2 or you know things like that. Um, and there's also some loops that we'll also go into at the end. Um, there's also input and output. So this allows you to input text directly into the computer and then they can also print statements out for you to see. Um, and then you're also going to be doing some math calculations because you have like the ability to multiply or divide, etc. And then you'll also see some uh, program commenting. And so basically the, we'll explain further more about why comments are so important, but this basically allows you to like make little notes in your code for you and other programmers to read. So these are some interesting topics and um, there's obviously more to C++ as you go later on into the um, language and you can learn more about it. But for now, like this is a great start and it's really good to see if this is the language for you and if you're interested in coding it because it's really important. Okay, so for a split screen, basically what we're saying is like it may be helpful to pull the YouTube video tab out and away from the browser so that you can both have this video going at the same time as you open like um, REPL, which will be what you're going to be coding on. And so you can see both this, um, both like the video at the same time as well as what you're trying to code on so that you can see and compare like the codes that we're doing or you know what to type into REPL. And so Niha is currently going to be showing you um, how to open REPL. So if you look, yeah. At, yeah. So REPL is the online compiler that we'll be using and um, we'll get more into it, but we'll show you later. And this is how it should look like on the left. You should have your um, the YouTube video with the slides and us talking. And then on the right, you can have your code. 
Okay, so before we get into REPL, we'll do like a quick little icebreaker. So I want you guys to think about um, these questions on the screen we have right here. So what do you think programming is about? So what do you think um, you'll tell the computer to do and what part do you think the computer will do? Because we know that computers are super smart and they can do lots of things. So why do we need programmers? Like what, what's the use of us? What, what do we need to type into the computer? Um, and then what languages have you used before? Personally, I've used Java and Python and Rena said she used Java and HTML. And like personally, we've seen how they're actually pretty similar to C++. So be thinking about that. And then what are some apps or companies that you think use a lot of coding? So like even PowerPoint and um, Excel and Word, these are all part of the company Windows. And um, they use a lot of um, C++ and other languages to build a lot of their apps. So what do you um, think, like any apps in your daily life that use a lot of coding that you think might use C++? So you might want to pause this video, think about that and um, replay the video when you've thought about it a little bit. So let's talk about what programming is about. So based on these questions, I want you guys to realize that programming is you're the coder, you're going to type in instructions for the computer to use. But what you'll be learning is how to phrase these instructions, what order to put them in, what format to put them in, so that your computer understands them. Because if you put in plain English, it might not like register it because it needs those certain commands and keywords that are specific to the language. Um, and then these different languages, we have C++, Java, all those languages, they all like, they're different in the sense that they are like preferred for certain things. They have certain aspects of them that make them better for building certain applications and software. But the main thing that they're trying to do is solve real world, real world problems. So you can see we have a bunch of companies that use C++ and Windows lets users um, present, write Word applications, um, use Excel sheets. Lyft is kind of like Uber where you're able to travel to places. So you've got the map, um, you've got Roblox, we've got Mac OS and Google. These are all some companies that use C++ and um, C++ is a big part of them. Some of them use other languages with it, but there's a reason that C++ is something to use, and we'll be learning that today. What makes C++ special? Yeah, and don't feel discouraged if, like, you know, it seems like we're learning really simple stuff, because programming is all about, like, gaining more knowledge as you continue going through, right? Like, Niha and I are still not even that proficient at, like, C++, because we didn't really learn it as much as we did Java. And so we're constantly learning more. And like, there's other ways that you can seek help for like more C++ information. There's always Google. Um, there's always more tutorials out there if you are really interested. And we like highly suggest that you go out and you go look for like these other um, like resources if you are interested. So for part one of this, we're going to be talking about comments, um, console output, variables, user input, and simple math. And so by the end of this first part, you'll be able to know what all of these do, how to write code with all of these, et cetera. So let's move on to comments. Exactly. OK, so you see that what's on the screen is currently written as a comment. And so you see two forward slashes and then a bunch of text written after it. Anything that follows the two forward slashes will not be recognized by the computer. The computer just ignores it. It's just for you and for other programmers out there to like have this information. And so a lot of the times we use comments to describe what the program does, right? It's a lot easier for you to write out in real English, like what this code does versus having to make the pro like all other coders sit there and like look through your code to really understand what it does, right? This is mainly for convenience, especially when you're like moving code between different programmers. And a lot of people also comment at the top of their code, like their name and what the project is. Yeah, so if other people were to look at your code or if you were, you were going to look at it later on, it's just to help understand it. So we're going to look at our first program. So Hello World is the typical first program for all sorts of languages where it's outputting or printing out Hello World. 
So before we get down to the big glaring hello world down here, let's look at what you have to include. So these might seem a little complicated, but we're just gonna be um, looking at them right now and you'll learn what they mean later, but we'll just look at a little bit of it. So first we've got this line, it's the pound symbol, which you can get from clicking shift three and then include um, and then the open carrot thing and then IO stream and the closed carrot thing. So what this means is that you're essentially importing a library called IO stream and it has a bunch of code that people have already written, um, which you can use for your code. So you don't have to rewrite it. And it has like keywords that um, make up your code that like C++ is able to understand. Um, and it's important to recognize how this is lowercase, this is lowercase, and the certain order of things. So again, um, we're looking at the order, we're looking at um, how things are phrased, the spaces and all that. Because with certain keywords, if you put in something extra, or don't have a capital letter, then it won't register and it might cause an error. And then the next thing we have is using namespace STD. Um, so STD just means standard. So that means that you're using a standard namespace and this standard main namespace has um, certain uh, functions like C out, which we'll talk about later. So by using the namespace STD, we wouldn't have to write out STD, um, the two colons every single time. It's just like a um, certain thing to make it easier to code. And again, this may not make sense, but you'll learn it as you go on later in your journey through C++. But for now, just know that these two things are incredibly important and to include them like every single time you code. Um, and then at the end, we have this thing called a semicolon, which you've probably seen in like your English class or writing. And a semicolon is extremely important, both in Java, C++. It's to end a program statement. So right here, you can see I have a semicolon here, semicolon here, and semicolon here. We'll go into detail like what a program statement is but just know that usually for everything, you're going to have to end in a semicolon. Um, so it lets the computer know that you're done with that statement. And then the next thing here, we have our main function. So what your main function is, is inside of the main function, whatever you put, you know that your um, computer is going to run it. So it's gonna look for the main function and then run it. And you've got this thing called int, which stands for integer. And um, what that means is that your program is going to return an int at the end of the main function, which we'll go into again later. Um, and right here, we've got an open parentheses and a closed parentheses, and there's nothing in them because your program isn't taking in anything. This is typically where you put your parameters, which is for later. Um, and then we've got our curly brace. So this is really important with coding. This is your open curly brace, and this is your closed curly brace. They go in pairs, and you'll see when we type it into REPL, it kind of, like, it um, puts the, both the open one and the closed one, and you've got to make sure you type in between it. Um, and we'll code this in REPL and, like, type it out, and you'll see how we do it. Um, and then inside of the main function, so whatever is inside your main function is what your computer is going to run. So inside of there, we've got our code, like what we want to do, right? So we finally to the code, um, you see C out. So this is typically what you use when you want to print out something. So you're, it's going to print out to the console and then two um, carrot things that are open to the right. And then we've got a hello world. And the hello world is in quotation marks. So these quotation marks you probably use as well, and you can type in whatever you want into the um, quotation marks. You can put in numbers, everything, stuff like that, and um, it's just gonna print it out. And then we've got another set of carrots, and then end L. This is an L, not a one, and it just means to end the line. So, um, we'll, so what your computer does when it sees the end L is it prints out whatever's right here and then it goes to the next line. It basically like clicks enter. So we'll look at that. 
And again, we've got our semicolon, which is important because we're ending this statement. And then we've got a return zero. So remember earlier when we were talking about the int? So your computer needs um, your code to return an int to know when it needs to stop. So the main message stops whenever it's got an int. So in this case, an int is an integer. So it's like anything negative, zero, positive, but no decimal. So it once you return that zero, it knows to stop and do what's after the curly brace, or if there's nothing after, then it doesn't do it. And remember for now, it's only going to do what's inside of the curly brace. So if you type anything out here, it's not going to recognize it, and it'll probably throw an error. So let's ex actually code this into REPL. So I'm going to... Um, Okay, so as she pulls it up and puts the code into REPL, um, just remember that if you were to put anything after the return zero, but still within the two curly braces, you're still not going to get the computer to recognize it. Because as soon as the computer sees that return zero, it's done. So if you put the, count, uh, the C out statement under that again, you're, it's not going to print it twice. It's going to print it once and it's going to end. Yeah, so don't type anything right here either. So I'm going to click start coding. And um, we're coding in C++. I've created a REPL. You can sign up and make your own account if you'd like to like store your code. Or I'm just going to go in as anonymous. So you see they've already typed this stuff out for you. But for I want to make sure that um, you guys get uh, used to coding it. So I'm just going to retype it. So. Um, again, we've got our pound symbol include and then our IO stream. And then we've also got um, using namespace STD. Um, and then our int main. And you see how the curly brace just automatically came after you typed the first one, there's a second one to close it. So REPL is pretty good about making sure that you always have that second curly brace. Just make sure that when you're typing, you type within that second curly brace. Exactly. So another thing that I want to um, emphasize is you see how it's kind of like indented here. So with C++, indenting isn't necessary but it's good to um, use in order to like improve the readability of your code so that it's easy to understand. Like you know that this stuff that's indented right here is inside of your main method. So I, I think REPL already like um, helps you indent it, but you just click a tab normally if you want to add stuff. So um, I have all my code written out and you see I have my curly braces. I've got my semicolons right here and I'm not typing anything after right here um, and let's try running it and the thing on your right right here it's actually called your console and it has whatever you output and you can also enter an input which we'll cover later so you can see it's outputted hello world so this is it's just so showing that it's going to print out what's in the main so it I'll put it hello world. If I put in an extra exclamation mark, it's going to, I'll put out extra exclamation marks. Um, and then another thing. So we were talking about end L, which was the end line. So what that does is it clicks enter. So if I were to put in um, a second thing like by world, so, um, and if I were to print this out, you see how this one came on a separate line. By world came after hello world. But if I didn't have this, and if I just had it like this, without the end L and the carrots, then it will print it on the same line. You can see there's no, it didn't click enter basically. So if you want it to have a separate line, you put in the end L. And then this part, it doesn't really matter unless you put something after it. So you can experiment, or you can see that your cursor is still up here. So you can experiment and see what different things return 
um, different things. And if you run along with an error, look at your code to see like what types of errors you make. So like if I forget my semicolon up here, I click run, then it says expected and the semicolon after using namespace std. So the thing about these compilers is they're pretty accurate in what they, when they tell you like what you made a mistake on, but sometimes they might be hard to understand. So it's good to like look over your code and see um, what you made a, may have made a mistake on. So we return to our hello world. And now we're gonna make it say hello to you. So this is what Rena is going to do. And again, so this is our, so the thing with these programs is we're going, if you want to save them as a text file and refer to them later, you can open up Notepad and type it in and then file, save as, and then I can save it as hello world. So then I've got a hello world text and then I can keep adding to it if I want. Okay, so for it to make it say hello to you, we already know that it'll basically print whatever you have in your quotation marks, right? So Miha showed you like, what if you say hello world and then you add like a bunch of exclamation points, right? So in this case, if we don't want it to say hello world, and we want it to say hello to your name. So like, hello Reina, instead we would just remove world and we would put, you know, whatever your name is, or in my case, Reina, and it would, compile and then it'll print out hello Reina with exclamation points. Exactly and remember if you change your code even a little bit to click this um, green um, run symbol to make sure it compiles every time. Okay um, and then now we'll be printing a countdown. Okay so for your next exercise we're going to be figuring out how to print a countdown. So we saw how to print out hello world so now the question is how can we print out a countdown from 10 to zero and then print out a blast off? So like, I would encourage you to pause this video here and just think to yourself, like, what things do we know that we need in our next code? And so let's just talk it out, right? So you know you're probably gonna need a C out statement because that's how you're gonna get it to print. You know you're going to need the C out statement in a main function because that's the only way the computer is gonna recognize it within a function. And because you know it's, we're talking about a main function that you're going to be calling, uh, that's going to be expecting an int, you're probably going to have to return zero at the end for it to know. And then of course, you're probably going to need all the stuff that Niha told you in the beginning with like the pound, include, the IO space, et cetera, because that's just going to make your life so much easier for the rest of the coding, like she explained. So let's see what, uh, how we would code this. Okay, so you see again that all this stuff about pound include and the using namespace, et cetera, like all of this is still there because we consistently want to keep it from code to code. Um, and then you also have the int main again, this is your main function, as we said, and anything you put in here is going to basically run. And so you see there's two C out statements. There's one that goes 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 in your quotation marks, basically stating that it'll print this all out even though it's technically numbers, because you're putting it within the quotation marks, it acts more as like, a, it acts as a string instead of like a list of numbers or instead of like as an int. And then- And by string, she just means like a text. Yeah, yeah, string. So we'll talk about strings later on, but basically it's just working as like a thing of text that the computer knows to print out. And then you're gonna do the carrots again, and then you're going to end the line so that it'll um, like enter to the next line. And then you see the second C out statement. And in this case, we see blast off. But you see that it's like very, it doesn't look like just the word blast off. So if you look at it closer, it's blast off with a backslash N. So you probably are wondering like, why is this backslash N here? And why is there no like double caret and then the end L statement, right? And so this combination of the backslash N is basically a special character. And so it tells the program to like make it a new line. So it's the equivalent as if you were on the keyboard and then you were typing some stuff and then you hit enter. And so it basically goes to the next line of code. And when you have this backslash N, you have to make sure that the, black, the backslash N is within your quotation marks. And if you do this, then you no longer need the last two carats or the end, uh, the end L with the semicolon. But you still need the semicolon at the end because it's the end of a program statement. 
you just don't need the end L anymore because the backslash N works as if you were to move on to the next line. And then finally, it ends with the return zero, like we've already been talking about, like how you get the, um, the computer to realize you're done running the function, uh, running the like main um, function and stuff. So we can click run and it prints out 10987654321 and blast off. Um, and like we know, was saying, this has to be inside of the quotation mark. You can't put it outside. And this is actually called an escape sequence. And remember that this is a backslash, not the forward slash that we're using for comments. Like this one, like uh, the forward slash. And you're, again, look, it doesn't recognize it. Um, it recognizes it as a comment, but it doesn't include it in your code. And then this one's a backslash. So remember to use that distinction. It has the same function as n l. Yeah, so if you wanted to, you could get rid of the backslash n and then outside of the quotation marks, you do two more carrots and you do the end L and then the semicolon and it works the same way. Exactly. So I'm just going to again copy this, open up notebook, paste it, and then save it as blast off. This is just so um, that you have these codes later on for you to like experiment with or just to, you know, see again. So we're going to start with our clean slate, which is just returning zero in the main. Okay, so now we'll be looking at data types. So data types are pretty important in C++. So um, again, we've got our include IO stream and namespace std, and then in our main function, we've got a bunch of code right here. So these are actually our data types. So data types um are basically different types of variables that you can have so we can have number variables decimal variables letter variables word variables so variables are like in math you have the variable x and x can have the value of three um, and but if it's an integer then it can only have the value of a number and not a decimal so there's different restrictions for certain types of data types and for certain types of variables that you can have. And so basically, right here we have our first variable and it's an integer. So you would write int lowercase. Um, so this is just the keyword for C++, which is lowercase int. And then we've got the name of our variable. So in this case, this would be like x, but the name of our variable for this one would be number. I can put like number six, it can be whatever I want. I just need to make sure like I put number, whatever I put up there um, into whatever I'm using it. So this is the name of our variable and then we initialize it. So initialize is just a big term for saying we're creating a variable and we have a certain value for it now. We're just storing a value for it and we can change it later. So we're storing um, 21 for the variable number and um, we've got our semicolon as usual, and then we're printing it out. And you can see that this one is different from this one because this is inside the quotation marks. So it's just going to print out straightforward N U M B E R number is equal to. And this one, on the other hand, since it's not in quotation marks, it's going to print out what the variable we had stored it at as. So it's going to print out number equal 21 in the end line. Um, so then let's look at the different types of variables. So we've got a decimal, which is stored as a double data type. Um, and so it can store decimals, it can store 21.0. Um, so it's another type of number variable, but ints can't store decimals. Um, then we've got a car, which is basically a character, and it can store only one single thing. So it can store a letter, or I could even have it store like the number one, but it would be storing it as text. It wouldn't be storing it as, like you couldn't add with it, which we'll go into later. But so typically we think of it as letters. And then we've got our string and string is like text. So hello, I can put in whatever I want in here. Um, and it'll print that out whenever I say see out that word. And then we've got this special thing called Boolean. And Boolean is, um, a variable, the data type, 
that can have two values, true or false. So in this case, we've stored it as true. And this is used later on with our if and else, like determining whether or not something is true or false. So if I said two equal three, two equal equal three, that's not true. So then the value of that variable would be false. And it might sound confusing right now, but we'll go into it later. Um, so I'm just gonna type, and we've got to return zero, but I'm just gonna type this out and see what it prints out. Okay, so we've got our int main and then, or I'll copy and paste it. Yeah, but it's good for awesome. you guys to type it out. Okay, um, let's run this. Okay, so it's printed out number so we've got number equal in the space. So that's just the regular text. And then we've got the variable 21 and it's gonna print out it as a variable. And we've got the same for all of these, except for Boolean, you see, we set it as um, Boolean is true, but it printed out a one. So this just means, so in Java, I mean, not Java, C++, true is going to be one and false is going to be zero. So True is like the lights on. So like it has something in it. False is like there's nothing there. So it's gonna print out a zero. So even if I print out true or false, it's gonna print out a zero, even if it's false. And this cannot be confused with string, which is text. So you can see it lit up and it's blue and it's text is typically red but you can see that this is not going to print out the word false. Okay, um, and then I can save this again. You can save it as a text file, but let's move on to the next thing. Okay, so again, we're just going to clean the slate. We're going to get rid of everything that's in that main function, except for the return zero, and then we're going to move on to the next exercise. So this next exercise is basically talking about how you're going to receive user data. And so it's basically saying like, if I want, like as a, as a programmer, if I want the computer to take in whatever I type out at one point and then turn that into a variable and then um, like um, to print that out again, it'll do that. So let's start looking at this code. So you already know like this top part and how important it is to just keep having it, but let's move on to like the actual main, right? And so in the main, you see there's string and that's basically saying what the data type is. So like Niho is talking about, the string is just some sort of like text per se, right? So you can, it could be like numbers, but it won't work as numbers. It'll work as just like some text. And then you're gonna call this variable user input. And first you're just gonna call it initialize. So um, real quick. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to pop in and say that you can see this is called camel casing. Yes. Um, so with variables and functions, we typically want to keep it lowercase, but if we've got two words in our variable, we can't put a space because um, C++ won't understand it. So you've got to keep it as one word, one like together, and how you differentiate between words is make the first letter of it capital, except for the first word. You can't make this capital. You can, but it's not recommended. But um, this is called camel casing. So again, we had it for true or false down here. We capitalize O and F. So we do the same with this. Yeah, okay. So like Mia said, camel casing is really important so that you can like clearly see what your variables are and they're not just a jumble of letters. Um, and so we're gonna call it user input. And so what you're going to make this, like what the, the value that's going to be assigned to this variable is initialize. So it's just in quotations and it's initialize. And then you end it with a semicolon because that's the end of the um, program statement. And then when you continue, it's going to be something else, right? So because we've already initialized the variable and we know that it's a string, the computer knows it's gonna be a string, we can change it again. So this time in the second line, you don't see us writing string, you just see us writing user input. And instead of calling it initialize this time, the value that's gonna be inside is new value. You still have that in quotation marks because it's a string, but you've basically 
Like the computer has now forgotten that the string value is initialized. The new value is now new value. And then the next line after that is the C out. So you see the two carrots and then you see the please enter a word and then press enter when done. And then you see the backslash N, which again is your escape sequence, which just tells you to hit enter for the computer. And so this is what the computer is gonna print out for you to see. And then when you see this, obviously, you're gonna follow the instructions, you're gonna type in a word, you're gonna hit enter, and then whatever you just entered is going to become the new variable. So that's your next line. You see it says C in. So we know that C out means uh, console out, and so that's sending information out to the, con uh, the console. So C in basically stands for console in, which is the statement for, you to, for the console to receive your input. And so then you do the carrots, but this time, instead of opening to the right, they're gonna to open to the left. And then you're gonna type in user input because now whatever you just typed in is now going to be the value for this variable called user input. So no longer is the value new value. If I put in um, dog, the user input is now, called, like the value associated with user input is now, a do is now dog. So then in the next line you see out, which is you print out again, you do the carrots and it says, uh, your input. And this is going to be printed out as literally your input because it's in the quotation marks. But then you do two more carrots and you see that it's user input, which means it's just printing out the value that's in this variable, user input. And like we said before, the value in user input is whatever you just typed in, which I said, for example, was dog. And then you see the backslash n again, which has to be in the, in the quotation marks. And it's the escape sequence. And it'll basically cause like It'll in, it's as if you hit enter on the keyboard, it'll bring another line, and then you return zero to completely end all of that. So the computer knows to stop. Yeah, and again, for C out, it's got to face, the carrot's got to face to the right. You can see here, here, here. So again, we'll just copy and paste it into our REPL, um, and then click run. So it says, please enter a word, press enter when done. So I can enter in the word pet girls. And then I click enter and then it says you input tech girls. So um, it might seem like a simple thing right now, but you can enter in different things and do things, different things with them in the future. If you're watching this, I think you should pause right here and then based on what we just talked about, like how would you be able to write hello and then your name? So think about what we talked about with the user input with C in, think about how you would ever print it out with C out, etc. So just take a moment to like try and figure that out for yourself and then we'll show you how it would be done. Okay, so um. Here, I'm gonna type it out as Rena tells me to. Okay, so again, you're gonna start off with the pound include and the using stuff. So let's just start with the main uh, function. So you're gonna type in string and then username because that's gonna be the name of the variable and the variable is gonna be a string. You're gonna do what it uh, equal because that's what you're setting the variable equal to. Now you're gonna put in quotations um, in this case, we say Linus or initial or anything. It's just, this doesn't matter because you're eventually going to change the value. And then you're going to put a semicolon because it's the end of a program statement. So the next line, you're going to go C out. And then you're going to do the two carrots. And you're going to do quotation marks again. And it's going to be, please enter your name. And you have two options here. You can do the backslash N with the quotation mark and then the semicolon, or you can do the end quotation mark, the two carrots and the end L with the semicolon. But in this case, we're gonna use the escape sequence just so that you guys become more familiar with escape sequences because they make your life a lot easier. Um, and so next, we're gonna bring in the C in. So this is when you finally get to input something that the computer is going to take in. And you're gonna do the, uh, the carrots that are facing the left, two of them, and you're gonna put in username. And again, see the um, camel casing there. And then the semicolon, which now means that whatever you just inputted 
is becoming the new value for the variable your name or username, sorry. And then the next line is going to be C out. And then it's going to be your carrots, your quotation marks, hello, comma. And then you're going to do two more of the um, carrots. You're going to put in the variable name, which is username, two more carrots, and then you're going to do the, you can do the end line or you can do the um, quotation marks, backslash n, and then the uh, semicolon. So it depends on whatever you want to do. And then make sure that you return zero. So Niha, uh, yeah. yeah. So in this case, let's see what happens if you don't do the return zero. Yeah. Um, you can see we didn't put the return zero in this time. And it did do the thing, but um, if this were, if you were to like have another method or a different class, it wouldn't get that int that um, it wanted. So like it works right now, but like it's just good practice to put in that return zero because um, like this might, oh, okay. So you can see I like messed up on my indenting here. It's an easy fix. Okay. So um, it works, but it's just good practice to put in that return zero so that it doesn't keep going over and over again. Um, and you give the main function what it wants. So you see, like, if we put in return zero and we put in our name, it's still going to print out a hello, Miha. And um, since we put that end L, it goes to the next line. OK. OK, so now we'll be doing something called a rhyme generator. So um, the program, what it should be doing is you enter in. So if you wanted to find the uh, words that rhyme with dog, then you'd enter in dog without the first letter, so just og. And the program should provide a list of possible rhymes. So um, you can see that these rhymes aren't necessarily real words, but like if you just um, wanted to find like things that sound like it, like random syllables. They don't have to be real words in this case. Um, so I guess you just go through the entire alphabet. So you can pause the video right now and try it and see how you do that. And like, again, like Rena was doing walking through it, you probably want to do C out and the A. It, so first you'd have like a variable with OG and um, that would be the user input. So you'd have to take in the user input. And then you would also have to print out A plus OG, B plus OG, but with the carrot thing. Um, and then all the way until Z, but like not all the way until then because that would be like a long um, set of code. Um, so you can pause it right now and try coding it on your own. Yeah, but no worries if you don't know how, because we're basically going to walk you through it in the next slide. Okay, so we've got our code, so we'll walk you through it again. So first, you've got a string, and you're just going to put in a random variable for your string, and it's called word to rhyme. We've got our camel case, and a cool thing about uh, REPL is that whenever you highlight the variable, it highlights the variable whenever it happens again down here. Um, and then we've got our C out statement. And then um, it says, please input everything but the first letter of the word you need to rhyme. And then, so like if you were trying to rhyme with the word dog, it'd print, they'd print in, they'd put in O and G. Um, and then we've got our escape sequence, backslash N again, and then our semicolon, incredibly important. Um, and then we're going to say whatever they input, I'm going to store into the variable that I made earlier called word to rhyme. And so now word to rhyme has the value of whatever they put in. So again, remember that we can change the values of these variables throughout our program. Um, and then it's going to print out A and then whatever they put in. So like word to rhyme. Um, so like a og and b og, and we've got our backslash ends as usual because we don't want to make it all in the same line. 
And then you would hypothetically go all the way to Z, but we're just showing a quick example right here. So we're just going to go through D. And again, we've used comments to show how um, you can do two forward slashes and like if someone really wanted to go all the way to Z, they'd continue on. And we've got our return zero. So let's try running this. So Rena, give me a word that you want, Ryan. Um, you should do mop. What rhymes with mop? Mop. So you're gonna I get rid of the M. <laughs> no, you have to get rid of the M, so it's op. So it rhymes with op. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's okay, just run it again. Okay, so OP. Okay, no, so again, like it was written. So I couldn't have just entered it in like OP. I'd have to rerun it so that it tells me. And then I'd type in OP and then I'd get AOP, BOP, COP, DOP. Yep. Cool. Um, OK, so we're going to be looking at some math, right? So Neha has already done um, me a favor and put the code into REPL so that we can just examine it from there. So let's take a look at what's in this main function. So in this case, you see the C out, you see the carrots, and then you see four plus five equals or all these other mathematical operations and these statements um, that are in these uh, quotation marks. So when you have these quotation marks, they're literally just going to print whatever is in the quotation mark. They're not actually going to do this operation for you. You're just going to see an output of four plus five equals. So what's after this, though, with the two carrots and then the actual four plus five, that's when the computer is going to actually do the operation. And it's going to um, print out whatever that like equals. So we know it equals nine and the computer does two. So it's going to print out four plus five equals and then it's going to put that variable or it's going to put that answer, sorry, to the four plus five and it's going to show it and it's going to show it to become four plus five equals nine. And then you're going to end the line. And then you're going to, if you look to the next line, it's basically the same thing, except it's a subtraction one. And so you're just going to use the little dash, and then it's going to print out 6 minus 2, but it's going to print this out after. Or So it's kind of confusing because you think of it as like, what's going to be printed out as just text, and then what is the computer actually going to use and do the math with? So this first part, everything within these quotation marks, it's just going to print out as text. The computer doesn't read this as numbers and think, oh, I can add six plus two. That's why you have to do the second part after these two carrots that actually do the operation with six minus two. And then you do the end line. In the next one, you do C out again, but this time we're doing multiplication. So while some of you guys might be familiar with doing multiplication with like an X in the middle, what's different is that you have to use an asterisk here. And so in this case, we're showing you that four times two, or you can write it out because this is all just text, is equal to, and then after the two carrots, you see the actual operation with just the asterisk, and then it'll end the line there. And then for this next line, it's nine divided by three, but it's a forward slash. Um, but again, this is just text. So the real, the part where the computer does the real math is this green part right here where the numbers are in green and you see that it's nine uh, forward slash three and this will divide the numbers for you and then you end the line. Another way you can do this is if you first initialize variables to hold a certain value. So in this case we have int num1 um, is equal to seven. So num1 contains the number seven and num2 contains the number four. So then what you do next is you do c out with the two carrots and you print num1 times num2 or in this case, it's seven times four, because if you're not the coder, you might not know what num1 and num2 equals. So it may be more useful for you to put seven times four and then equals, and then in the operation, you do num1 times num2. This is allowed because the computer knows what numbers are being held in these two variables and they can do the math. And then they'll output 28 and then it'll end the line. But what's weird with this next one is I'm gonna have Niha run it and you would think it would work the same way because it's just division. But once Neha runs it, you're going to see why the output is different than what you expect. And another thing, you can see we forgot our curly brace that closes. So what um, the compiler has done for us is it did like a little squiggly line and it says expected um, the closed curly brace. Then I could just add it in and it, the error goes away. 
Okay, so let's take a look at what this last statement produced. So I had num1 divided by num2, or 7 divided by 4, and equals 1. So we all should know that 7 divided by 4 does not equal 1. In fact, it should be like 1.75 or so. And this is because what happens is if you look at your variables, you put them as ints. So you defined and you initialized these as integers, which means that they only carry these whole numbers. So when you perform this operation of division, the computer knows that it should be 1.75, but because you put in two ints, it's going to return an int. So it's not going to round or anything. It's just going to chop off those last two decimals and give you whatever the first whole number or whatever the whole number part of it was. And so in this case, even though it should be 1.75, the, the 0.75 gets chopped off and it just outputs a one. And so now the question is, how can we solve for this, right? Because you don't want a computer doing math and telling you that seven divided by four is one. Like that's extremely inaccurate. So what can we do to solve that? So just take a second to like think, especially about the data types that we talked about. Like how could we possibly solve this? To get like that decimal 1.75. Yeah. Okay, so what we could do is instead of having these all as ints, we can change them to doubles. So the perk of having a double is it will have decimals for you, but you don't have to change these numbers to 7.0 and 4.0 because it's already assumed so by the computer. If you don't add a decimal to the end of this integer, it's just assumed to be 0.0 at the end. And it's the same value, but this time when you run it, just make sure that you hit run again, and then it'll actually solve it out, and you'll see that it'll give you a double for an answer. There we go. Even though that took a, time, a bit of time to compile, you mm -hmm. see that it came out with the 1.75. And um, in order for it to return a decimal, only one of the numbers actually has to be a double. So I could have this, and it would still return 1.75. Both of them don't have to be that way. So I could have 7.0 and 4. Um, and also, if I didn't have variables that had the names, I could just write in 7.0 and it'd recognize that that's a double and it'd print out the thing as a decimal. So if I run this, this would also be right, but if I just had 7 and 4, it would be 1 or 4.0 or 7.0. So just play around with it and see like which, um, what, what types of variables lead to what types of Answer. Yeah, so like for now, it might not make sense to use variables and to, you know, give these numbers, like assign these numbers to a variable and use the variables for your math. But if you think about it, like what if instead of like num1 being seven, what if it's like, I don't know, 1,572,361? Like I'm not going to type that out every time I want to do a code statement. So instead, by assigning it just to like num1, you can just use num1 as part of it and then um, it'll know what value you're trying to access and it'll do the math directly with that. Yeah, and another thing is um, I, if, if I were to use a variable, I would have to make sure if I made this a 4.0, I would have to make sure to change this as a double, otherwise it's gonna return an error. Um, so like again, make sure whichever data type that you're using is able to support the number yeah it's a big matching game so you always want to like watch out for these errors because they're kind of easy to do accidentally okay so this is the slide after that and you're gonna see that it actually uses the doubles again and so this is to show you again how if you want it to come up with a 1.75 instead of the one, you just have to change the um, variables to become doubles. And you don't even have to put the 7.0 or the 4.0 because it's assumed so by the computer and you can just do the math with it directly. And so again, it's if we wanna look at it like line by line, you already see how the C out with the division of the decimal one and the decimal two end up with 1.75. The next line is the 4 plus 8, and you already have that as a variable, but then you tack that on as a variable later where it directly accesses it. So the computer does the math, and then the variable takes that value on, and then will output as that. And then you see that answer occur for like the rest of these.
Yeah, but the thing with this one, since even if you had decimals, like the double values that you used to um, multiply this out, since you're storing it as an int, it's going to print out as a one. But in the second one, you see, since you're storing it as a double, it's going to print out what you want. Yeah. So yeah, keep that in mind when doing certain operations. Just make sure that they that your data types match what you want it to output. And that's extremely important because if not, then your calculations will end up incorrect or you'll produce errors if you try and put like like letters in your int um, variable, etc. Okay. So the next program we'll be doing is um, it, you're gonna ask so you're gonna ask your user for two numbers and they'll input in two numbers. And then you, as a programmer, will have to add the two numbers, put them in a variable, and then output it as a variable. So go ahead and pause the video and try to do it on your own using REPL. Okay, um, so let's actually do this on our own. So we take that out. Um, and then we've got to create two new variables to um, make to um, store the input in. So I got int num one is equal to, and I'm just going to put zero. Int num two is equal to zero. And then I'm going to tell the user to input out an integer. So C out. Please input an integer. Um, and then I'm going to do my backslash n so that it goes to the next line. And then um, whatever they put in is going to be my num1. And then again, I'm going to tell them to input another integer. And then whatever they input is this time is going to be my num2. And then I'm going to print out the sum of it. So I'll be like your sum of num and then I'm going to specify what num1 is and num2 is of num1 and num2 is and I'm going to put in my spaces right here is um and then whatever the sum is so I could create a new, so in the instructions, it says you have to create a new variable for your sum. So I do int sum is equal to num1 plus num2. And the sum variable would be what I put in right here. And then I'm just gonna put my end line. So it's, it's kind of confusing here because we've got so many of these, but I'm just going to go one step at a time. So I'm gonna say your sum of this number and this number is this number. Um, and then we've got our return zero. So let's run it and see what happens. If I put any errors in, um, four and eight. So you see an error here is that there is no space after four and there is no space after eight. So then I would put in a space right here and put in a space right here. So you'd run it out, see if you made any errors. So we'll try it again. So now we've got our spaces between the numbers. And then again, I don't have a period over here. So then I make a new and then run it out. Make sure after any changes you make, you've got to um, recompile. Yeah. yeah. So you see how we coded this, and I've made some errors along the way, but I still fixed it. Yeah, just some things to note. Realize that when she has this num1 and the num2 in the code, they're not red and they're not in the um, quotation marks, which is why it doesn't print out your sum of num1 and num2. It prints out the actual numbers that she typed in, like 4 and 8. So make sure that if you're going to be using the variable, you don't want it to show up red because you don't want it in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's recap what we've done so far and let's take a short break. So, um, 
So far, what we've learned is, so we've gone over comments, which are your two forward slashes. Um, those don't actually like tell the computer anything. Those are just for programmers and yourself to understand like what you're doing or like just to name the uh, name your code at the top so you know that it's yours. Um, we learned how to print out hello world and some of the stuff that makes up your codes such as like the what the main function is and the return zero that comes with it. You learned how to print like a count out and you know how to do that with the escape sequence of backslash n. Um, and you learn some different data types in C++. So you learn like string, care, double, int, et cetera. You even learned Boolean, which was pretty cool. And then um, you learned how to like have user input change some of that, whether or not you use like integers to do some math or whether or not you're inputting a string for to say, hello, your name, et cetera. So we've learned a lot so far. So feel free to like pause the video, stretch a little bit, um, take a snack or something, um, or like just go back over what we've learned and just take a break real fast. So for part two, we're gonna be going over some of the logic. So we're gonna be talking about if statements, else statements, if else statements, and then also handling some input and like talking about a final project that you guys might wanna do. So if you don't know what if statements are or like else statements, we're basically gonna be going into this next. So if statements are basically saying if Actually, let's do it through this example because this will be definitely way easier for you to understand through the code. So let's look to the main method. So first we're going to initialize this variable called my number and it's going to be an integer and we're going to give it the value of 40 and we're going to add the semicolon at the end. So next the statement is if and then you have the two parentheses to embody what this condition is. It's going to say if my number is greater than 30 and like let's just think about this. Let's just think about this. Sorry. You know that my number has a value of 40 and you know that 40 is greater than 30, which means that whatever this follow, whatever follows this if statement and the two curly braces within that, it's going to do that condition. It's going to, uh, because the condition is true, it's going to do whatever that says. So in this case, it says you're going to see out and then you're going to say the number, which is just going to be whatever the number is. So in this case, 40, and then it's going to be followed by this string of it is, or is a pretty big number. And then you're going to see this escape sequence. So what this is saying is if your number is greater than 30, it's going to say this number is a pretty big number. So like, let's put it into REPL and see what it does. So again, you're just going to type it into the main function. Yeah. Um, and then part of this code is on this slash this. Yeah, we'll go through all the code once we put it on REPL. And especially with like these logic statements, like if statements and if else statements, you're gonna make sh you're gonna want to make sure that your brackets um, or your sorry your curly braces like line up especially because this is when you start seeing a lot of curly braces and you need to make sure that everything that's within the curly brace belongs in that curly brace and it goes along with the condition that you're trying to meet. So let's break this down a little bit. So you see this first part. We know that my um, number. Real quick. Yeah. So uh, multi-line comment. So like we had comments like this, but if we want to just do a comment for like a bunch of lines, we do the forward slash and the asterisk, and then we do it wherever we want it to end. So right here. Yeah. But um, and then. So, so it's like forward slash asterisk and then asterisk and then forward slash to end it. Mm -hmm. So it's embodied within and it knows to comment all of that out. So then let's run that part that Rena explained. Okay, so yeah, so you know that my number has a value of 40. It plugged 40 in basically and it asked if 40 is greater than 30, which we know is a true statement because we know 40 is bigger than 30, then it does that following statement within the curly braces. So that following statement said to print out and then print out your number and then put after that is a pretty big number. And that's exactly what it did. It printed out 40 and said is a pretty big number. And then you see the escape, escape sequence and the semicolon to end that off. And then the curly brace at the end um, ends off that statement following the, that first condition. 
So now is the second part. So in this case, we already have this variable defined as an int, but we're going to change the variable value now. So instead of being 40 like it used to, we're going to change it to 20. So now we're going to have a new if statement. So this first statement is the same. So this first condition says that if my number is greater than 30, it's going to say this number is a pretty big number. But there's an else, which means that if the first condition is not true, then we go to the second condition. So if not the first, then the second. So the second condition is just anything that is not the first. So in this case, as long as it is not greater than 30, which means it can equal 30 or it can be less than 30, you, fall, you do this second um, line of code, which is within these two curly braces right there that you see are kind of highlighted right now. And so you do this statement, which is a C out, you print out that number that you put in, in this case it's 20, and you say it's a fairly small number. So if we comment out the rest of this bottom part and we run it again, you're gonna see that it's gonna print out 20 is a fairly small number, as well as 40 is a, fairly, is a pretty big number because of the first statement, which is still there. Okay, so let's look at this bottom part again. So let's think about what the flaw is with these first two. So you have a statement that says, if it's greater than 30, it'll print out it's a pretty big number. If it's less than 30, it'll print out it's a fairly small number. But what happens if this number is equal to 30, right? We don't have anything accounting for this yet. So this is where this last part comes in. So now it says, if my number is greater than 30, you do what we've been talking about where you say it's greater than 30. Else, if it's not greater than 30, but it follows the second condition, which is, in the, which is in the parentheses, the second condition is that the number is less than 30. So if it's 20, then you'll print out is less than 30 along with the number. So it'll say 20 is less than 30. But if it doesn't satisfy either of these two conditions, if it's neither greater than 30 nor less than 30, then the only alternative is that you, um, is that like you made some sort of error and you put in like a character or something, but then you'd see like an error or it's equal to 30, which is why the printout is the number or like the variable or whatever value is in my number and then is equal to 30. Because now we've accounted for it being greater than 30, less than 30, as well as equal to 30. Um, and then you can see with the one that we just did, we've got something called an else if. So if you've got more than just if and else, we use else if, and I can keep on adding else if here like Right here, I could put in another else if, like, right there. But, like, that's only if I had another condition that I'd want. So if I want more things that I want to account for, then I keep using the else if. And the last one's just going to be called else. Yeah. So but remember that if you do else if, you need to follow, follow it with, a, uh, with two parentheses. And inside has to be some sort of condition that you can test for. If not, then it's just an else statement, and that means anything that is not the first statement suddenly, or first or second, or anything that happens before, then it suddenly falls into this last category of just else. So then you can see that it's a 20 is less than 30. Let's try and see what would happen if we put in 30. Then you'd see that it is equal to 30. One other thing that's worth mentioning is if you look at that second statement, there's only one condition. It's either if the number is greater than 30 or all else. So even if it's equal to 30 or less than, it's going to print out as a fairly small number, which is why in that second line of code that comes out, you see 30 is a fairly small number because everything else besides being greater than 30 will fall under that category. Yep. Okay. So now we'll um, move on to something called modulus operators. So modulus sounds pretty weird. Um, you might not have heard of it, but it's basically one like another operator. So like we have plus for addition, minus for subtraction. The modulus is for remainder. So let's like look at this. So if I were to find seven modulus two, okay. So if I were to do seven divided by two, so this is my division thing. Um, so two goes into seven three times. So two times three is six. And then I subtract one um, and then I get one. So we know we've got three remainder one. So what modulus basically does 
is it gets that remainder for you. So seven mod modulus two is equal to one. So you can try experimenting with different numbers and seeing what we get, but um, that's what modulus does. So let's try putting this number, this stuff in. Yeah, so one of the questions that you might want to think about is like, what is one of the purposes for this operation? Like, why do we need it? Like, if you think about it, there's some application to it, which we'll discuss once we go through the code some more. Exactly. So um, first, we've just got our top one that says 7 mod 2 is equal to, and let's comment this part out. Okay, so let's run it and see what it gives us. So 7 mod 2 is 1, or 7 divided by 2 has a remainder of 1. And you can see that they put it in text, and um, they put out what they wanted to use a modulus for right here. Um, and then let's look at the rest of our code. So we've got a number variable, and it's going to be 50. And then it says if number mod two equal equal zero. So whatever is inside of the, the parentheses of the if thing is going to be a Boolean variable. It's either going to be true or it's going to be false. I'm not going to create a new variable called it, but um, we just want to know that like the value of it is going to be true or false. If it's true, then it's going to do whatever it says. If it's false, it's not. So number mod 2 equal equal 0. So 50 mod 2 equal equal 0. So if you think about this, if you divide any number by 2 and it's even, then it's not going to have a remainder, right? Um, because it's just going to divide evenly into 2 because any even number is made up of 2s, right? But if you've got an odd number and you're doing mod 2, then you're going to have to get 1. So what this thing does is it determines whether your number is even or not. If it's equal equal zero, then it's got to be even. So it's only going to go into this big if loop, if, if statement, if the number is even. And then it says, if the number is greater than 40, then print out your number is even and it's greater than 40. But if the number is less than 40, then it's going to say it's even, but it's not smaller than 40. Otherwise, if it's not greater or less, then it has to be equal to. So it says your number is even, but it's equal to 40. So you can see this is actually called a nested if statement. So um, we've got our big if statement right here. And then inside of the if statement, we've got these small if else statements that also, um, okay. So we've got these other if statements that the number has to go through after going through these. And then like to, for this big if statement, we've got an else. So you can see like the indenting, it's not necessary, but it helps you like understand that this part right here corresponds to this, while this corresponds to these, right? So then it says else, and the only other else would be if the number mod two is equal to one. Um, that case it's not even even it's odd um so then it's going to print out that your number is not even even so that's kind of a tongue twister but um <laughs> let's try running it and see what happens so we've got our number 50 so it should print out that it's even that's true and it's greater than 40. so let's try if we've got an odd number like 43. so 43 is not the number you need it's not even and then if we do have an even number, but it's less than 40, then it should go right here. So it is even, but it's smaller than 40. Or if it is 40, it is even, but it's equal to 40. So you can play around again and see like, what are the different types of conditions you can put? So if you're trying to like guess if someone's a teen or not, then you'd be like, um, if you're between 10 and 20, then, or 13 and 20, then you're a teen. Um, but if 
you're greater than that, then you've got to be an adult. If you're less than that, you've got to be a child. And then in the teens, if you're greater than 18, do you, can you have a license yet? Um, not like a big boy license. Um, or if you're less than 18, and you can just play around with that um, and see what types of statements return what types of things. Yeah, so one of the notable things is if you look back at that code, because there's a nested if statement, if you put in any sort of odd number, it skips all these other inside if statements. It goes directly from if the number, um, if the number mod two equals, if it doesn't equal zero, it skips all the way down to this last else statement saying it's not even even. So it mm -hmm. completely avoids the other inside if else statements. Yep. Okay. So now we're going to be talking about like handling user input. And so this is kind of going to like um, lead into your final project that we hope you guys will do just to like experiment some more with C++ and use some of the techniques that we've taught you. Okay. So again, you know the beginning because we've gone over this so many times. Let's just look into the main now. So we start with the string input. So it's the variable is called input and it's a string. And we're just going to keep it empty for now. We're just going to put some quotation marks and that's it. It's just going to be empty with nothing in it right now. So what the computer is going to do is it's going to print out this question. Do you have an idea of what program you want to write for your final project? So now it says for you to, it'll print out this other like option list. So it'll tell you to enter either yes, no, or maybe. So you might look at this and be really confused as to why there's so many slashes and so many quotation marks. So if you look at what Neha has highlighted, which is the backslash and the quotation mark, this actually allows you to make a quotation mark within your string. So in this case, it's asking you to enter yes or no or maybe. And those are all going to be with quotation marks. So it's not, so you're putting these quotation marks within the string itself, but the computer isn't reading it as if you cut off one string. So generally in strings, you need two quotation marks and then it'll, it, it'll print out whatever is within these two quotation marks as a string, but using this backslash quotation allows it to realize that this is all still a string, but you still want to put quotation marks inside the string. So this is another escape sequence. Like we were looking at the backslash n, so this is the backslash quotation mark. And again, like she was saying, because you've already got the quotation mark for the string on the outside, repeating it would like not work. So if you want it to print out a quotation mark, there's a special thing you'd have. Okay, so now we're going to look at whatever you inputted, and we're going to take that value, and we're going to call it, and we're going to change the variable input to equal whatever you just typed in. So let's say you typed in yes. So it says if input equals yes, then there's, you see these two brackets, and you see... Um, okay, so another thing um, which we saw earlier is you see how the equal sign is repeated here? So when we were initializing, so creating a new variable, we only had one equal sign. But now since we're checking if something is true or not, since we're like booleaning it, yeah. um, and since it's an if thing, we've got to use two equal signs. Yeah, so just make sure that you watch out for that in your if statements. So look for your two curly braces. You see them right there, they're highlighted. And so everything that's going to be in it is going to happen if, if you put in yes. So if the user inputted yes, it's going to be, it's going to output good. Start thinking about how you can use what you've been learning today to make that program. And then the escape sequence at the end. Else, if you as the user input no, it'll do what's in these two curly braces, which says, which will output, that's fine, keep thinking about it. Maybe talk to your classmates for some ideas. Else, if you didn't do yet, if you didn't input yes and you didn't input no, but your input is equal to maybe, then you do what's in these two curly braces, which says you output wonderful. Now you can start brainstorming. Try talking to your, some of your classmates for like about your ideas. And then you do the escape sequence again. Else, if it was not a yes, was not a no, and was not a maybe, it was anything else besides these three words, then it'll output what's in these two um, curly braces, which says that answer wasn't an option. Please try again. And then it'll have you try like another, like you'll have to run it again. You'll have to put in either yes, no, or maybe for it to work. And again, the return zero is there just so that it makes sure that it ends 
uh, all the code right there. So I'm going to put in maybe, and it says wonderful. And let's try. <laughs> that wasn't an option. And then you'd have to recompile to try again. OK. So um, one thing we wanted to talk about is how earlier we were doing the blast off program, right? And in the blast off program, we had to print 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, and then we had to print out blast off. But that, if we were having like a larger amount of numbers, so like if we were trying to do 50 all the way to one, that would kind of be time consuming. We'd have to do 50, 49, 48, all the way down there. So what we can do if we have something that we want to loop, we use something called a for loop. So um, for loops, they make this easier. So let's look at the code we have here. So um, I'm going to type it out. So we've got our main, and then we have this thing called for loop. So um, first I'm going to, so for loop, so you start with four, you've got your open parentheses, and then you have these program statements in there. So, so let's start with if we went from one to 10. So, um, First, we initialize i, this random variable, it's an integer, and it's going to be called i, and we initialize it to the number one, okay? And then it checks, is i less than 10? So is one less than 10? Yes, it is. So then it's going to go into the statement. So I'm gonna say, if it is, then i, oh, I wouldn't use the quotation mark. Okay, so um, it is, so then it prints out i, and then it goes back up here, and then it says i plus plus, and what i plus plus means is add one. So um, it would add one to i, and now i becomes two, and then it goes to this, so is two less than 10? Yes, so then it's gonna print out two, then it's gonna add one, is three less than 10. And so it's gonna keep going until at some point you're gonna to get to nine. Is nine, so then you're gonna print out nine and then you're gonna add one to nine, you get 10. And then it's 10 less than 10? No, so then once 10 is, so once you've gotten to 10, it's going to stop and then it's going to go outside and do whatever you want it to. So if I want it to blast off, Um, then it would blast off. So the thing about this one is it goes all the way until nine, like it prints out nine, adds one, 10 is 10 less than 10 and stops. But if I want it to um, include 10, then I do less than or equal to. So in this case, it'd be nine, add one. So it becomes 10 is 10 less than or equal to 10. And the answer to that is yes. So then it would go all the way to 10 and then do blast off. So let's try um, running that. So it does one, so you can see since we had the end L, it does it on separate lines. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and blast off. This way we didn't have to go one, two, three, all the way. Um, and another thing, since typically when we're blasting off, we go from 10 to one. Let's start with 10, and I has to be greater than or equal to one and then i minus minus. Yeah, so this is just making sure that you continuously take away, so 10 goes down until you finally reach to um, less than one, right? And that's when it'll like stop, basically. And then also make sure that you have the return statement of just zero, and that's just because it's a good habit to get used to right now, because you may need it if you start to have like other um, functions beyond just the main one, right? And so it's always a good habit to have the return zero, it may not produce an error in this case, but you still want to like check for it and make sure you have it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so real quick, just to clear up any confusion, I just wanted to go through the order. So first, once it initializes, so we're assigning each part to like each part as one thing. So one is this, two is that, three is that, and four is this, 
right? So once we've initialized it, um, it never initializes it again. So it goes one, checks if it's true, then prints it out, then does the subtraction or addition, then checks if it's true, prints it out, does the subtraction, addition, so then it keeps repeating three, two, four, three, two, four, three, two, four. So once it does that one, it never goes to it again, right? So make sure, like, try experimenting, see what happens if you change these around and what you get. So, like, look at the order. And it's important, if you want to, like, trace out and see what happens, you can, like, write out, um, you can make a table, have I here and output here. Output here, and then it would be like one, and then it prints out one, two, prints out two. So you can experiment with for loops and see all the ways that um, you can use them. Yeah, the major use for for loops is just to like cut down on how much code you have to write. Because like, think about if we wrote it the way we did the first time, and we wrote out and we were like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera, all the way till fifty. The perk of this for loop is literally you can change this number just to be fifty. Niha can run it and it'll print out all the way down from 50 all the way down to one without you having to type out all these numbers. And so it's, it's definitely to help efficiency. And like even if you, oh, sorry, but there's always like this, there's always alternatives for you. Like you can type it out if you really want to, but this is definitely a good skill to learn. Yeah. And even if you wanted to put your number is every single time, then it would put that in as well. Oh, and another thing, so your for loop is the curly braces. So since I only want the blast off to print out once at the end, because you're only blasting off once, then you're going to not put it in these curly braces. Your for loop is going to do what's inside of the curly braces only that many times. So if I had like another statement that says hi over here, then it's going to do that 50 times. Um, but with um, your blast off, it's not in there, so it's not going to do that 50 times. Okay, so we've learned about if statements, we've learned about arithmetic operations, so let's try to do something called, like, let's try to create a calculator. So your program should be able to, so your user can enter in two numbers, so that's like your user input, um, and then your user enters in either plus, minus, multiplication, or the forward slash to indicate division. And then you have to perform, your computer performs that operation and outputs the answer. So um, remember the thing with decimals is if you want a decimal answer, so like if you're dividing, you would want a decimal answer, right? You'd want to put in decimal type variable. So that was double. Um, so keep, be mindful of all those things, keep experimenting, and you can pause the video and try it out. Okay, so let's, I'll paste it in and walk us through the code. Yeah, so just remember, like, we're going to be showing you how to do this final project, but remember there's so many other types of projects you can do. Um, we totally encourage you guys to, like, try other projects with the code that we've shown you. We've shown you a bunch of logic statements, for loops, just basic, um, like C in, C out. There's so much that you have in terms of knowledge right now that you could go and do a bunch of different um, like projects. Mm -hmm. So um, they created a double variable so that they wouldn't have to um, change it up for the division. Um, and the double variable, we're just gonna initialize to zero, which is gonna change as they enter in the numbers. So then you're gonna have the car character and it's going to be your operation so along with entering the numbers your user is also going to enter what they want you to do with the numbers like add them together multiply them together whatever it is and they're going to enter in one character so it's going to be a plus minus um division or whatever and we're just initializing it to whatever i can make this six and make this a g um and then i'm going to print out enter your first number and then whatever they input is going to be my, it's going to be stored into my variable of num1. So num1 is going to have this variable that they enter in. 
same thing with number two. Um, and then it's going to say, enter out the operation you want, so what you want to be done. And it's going to give the options of what you can put in. Um, and then it's going to say your input is that operation now. Um, and then we've got our if statement. So if my operation is a plus, if they entered in a plus, then you're going to output num1, that text with the spaces, num2 is equal to, so in this case, this is going to put in whatever they entered. So it's not going to print out num1, it's going to print out whatever num1 is. So, um, and then it's going to print out the sum. Earlier when we did adding two numbers, we created a new variable called int sum. We don't need to do that. We could just put in num1 plus num2 and it'll recognize that it wants the sum, um, as long as it's not in quotation marks. And then we've got our period and our backslash n as usual. Then we do the same for subtraction. It again does num1 minus num2, whatever the difference is, the product is, and the quotient is. So essentially, you can even copy this, but make sure to like copy each individual part for each different operation, but make sure to change it for each part. And then else, we've got to have our um, if they didn't enter any of these, then we, we're going to say invalid input, please try again. So let's run it. So a number, let's do three. I'm kidding. Let's do. We'll do eight. a double because you put in, you allowed it to take decimals. So put in some random decimals. Okay, so 51.3. And then 8.62. So what do I want it to do? Let's say I want it to add. So I'm going to do that. So then it's going to tell me 51 plus 3, I mean 51.3 plus 8.62 is 59.92. So it can take doubles. Let's try, um, let's try with integers and see what it gives us. This time I want it to subtract. So you can see it doesn't even though it stored it as doubles, it's not going to do 5.0. Um, and it's just going to, and it can even handle negative numbers. Um, and then remember earlier we were looking at the division and how seven divided by four was not, or not seven, oh yeah, it was seven divided by four is not one, it's 1.75. So let's see what happens. I want it to divide 1.75, so that's perfect. And even if I want it to do modulus, so let's add in another one. So what if they entered in operation equal, equal, and then we've got our single, um, single quotation marks, the caret. If operation is equal to the modulus thing, then I'm going to do count num1, and then space mod, And you can see I'm not putting my spaces between here. They're not necessary. Um, it's just to like make it look organized. But for these, these Okay. Hey, Rena. Oh, so, okay. So I think we can do mod with double. The reason why mod doesn't work with doubles is because it, you can't find the remainder if you already do the multiple, if you do the division out and it gives you decimals, there's no longer a remainder. So that's one of the reasons why you can't actually do mod. But let's say if we wanted to do mod, let's scroll up and let's change that first. Um, let's change the variables just to be ints. And then now we can do it. So a lot of like um, this coding is just trying to identify like what will work, what won't work, and trying to like um, experiment. Cause like obviously we still make mistakes and we still are, but let's run it with yeah. just the ints. So we have seven, four. Oh, I forgot to put in that as an option, yeah. But it wouldn't make a 
different, but let's add it in later. So then say seven mod four is three, which is right because the remainder would be three. And then I add in. Okay. So you can experiment with it, add in things. If you want to add in a third number for addition, I don't think you do that for division. Yeah. But if you want to add in a third number, then you could also try with that. Yeah, so have fun with this program. So. Oh, and another thing is if, so if you were to add in a third number, then first you could start off by asking how many numbers do you want to put in? And then they'd put in three, for example, then you could do a for loop and like make it run three times or like, you know, make it like um, add in, like enter the first number, enter the second number three times. Um, and then change the first part to whatever number it is. So just experiment with it and see what you can do. Yeah, so we also suggest that you can create your own project. Um, there's a list of potential ideas on some resources like GitHub, um, or you can just like think what you would want to code and see if you could code it with what basic um, like skills we've taught you so far using like some of the logic statements or like Boolean. Like they're all pretty cool and they can do a lot of stuff. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So finally, um, thanks for coming and we hope that you learned something and that you guys will take this knowledge and hopefully do more programming with C++ because it's honestly a really fun language and it's a good basis for if you want to learn other languages as well later like Java um, or Python. And so, yeah. Yeah, there's so much more out there to learn. Look on Google. There's plenty of resources out there. And um, what you learned right now is a great start, like Lena <laughs> said. And um, keep experimenting. Keep trying new languages if you think this might not be for you, not, might not be it for you. And just continue coding. Yeah, there's a bunch of other tech girls um, like workshops you can do virtually right now or there may be more webinars coming out soon so we urge you to like go explore and <laughs> see what else is out there okay bye okay thank you bye